Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Princeton Public Library's virtual home here on Crowdcast. My name is Janie Herman, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you tonight to this event where we'll be uh, celebrating the release of the Writer's Library, uh, which was written by Nancy Pearl and Jess Schrager, or edited by them, it features the uh, interviews with many, many authors, and we're going to be uh, in discussion with Madeline Miller tonight. Uh, just before we get started here, I am going to see we having some, there we go, uh, feedback noise. There we go, fix that. Uh, so as you can see here on our little uh, home here on Crowdcast, there is an ability to ask a question. Please put your questions in there and upvote any questions that you would like to have particularly have answered by our authors at the end of the event. Uh, you can also see that we're partnering here with Labyrinth Books and you can order the Writer's Library directly from Labyrinth Books here in Princeton, New Jersey. They will ship anywhere in the country. And if you order from tonight, you get a 10% discount um, when you use the code PEARL. Um, so the code for tonight is PEARL. I have all the information at the top and you can also just click on the green box. And you can also do curbside pickup uh, if you live here in town, if you prefer to not pay shipping charges. Or you can go in the store during their hours because they are open again now. Uh, the other thing is, is that just for fun tonight, we put up a few polls about reading habits. Um, they're totally optional. We just kind of think they're fun and something different to do. So right now I am going to introduce our moderator for the evening and then uh, we will bring on the other guests. So it is my distinct pleasure to be welcoming Madeline Miller here tonight as the moderator. She is the author of two internationally best-selling novels which have been translated into over 25 languages. Her first novel, The Song of Achilles, was a New York Times bestseller and was awarded the 2012 Orange Prize for Fiction, which is now known as the Women's Prize for Fiction. It was also shortlisted for the 2012 Stonewall Writer of the Year Award. Her second novel, Circe, was an instant number one New York Times bestseller and was named one of the best books of the year by more than 20 media outlets. In addition, it won the Indies Choice Best Adult Fiction of the Year Award and the Indies Choice Best Audiobook of the Year Award and was shortlisted for the 2019 Women's Prize for Fiction. And really exciting, it is currently being adapted for a series with HBO Max. And I can't wait for that, and I'm sure everybody's excited. Uh, Madeline Miller has a BA and an MA in Classics and has taught Latin, Greek, and Shakespeare to high school students for over 15 years. God bless her soul. She currently lives outside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She visited us once in Princeton uh, for the launch of her book. And so it's great to have her back with us, even if it's just virtually. So I'm gonna bring her on screen now. Here she comes. And uh, she's gonna introduce Nancy and I'm gonna zip out of here and let Madeline take it away. Janie, thank you so much. I am just so thrilled and honored to be here um, talking to Nancy Pearl about the Writer's Library, which she and Jeff Schwager created. Um, it is absolutely a terrific, exciting, thrilling, tr literary treasure trove. Um, so I recommend that you all get it. It's these wonderful interviews of so many writers talking about their bookshelves, the books that were formative in their life. Um, it's funny, it's serious, it's thoughtful, it's fabulous. So Nancy Pearl is a best-selling author. She's a superstar librarian and she's a literary critic. She has been called America's librarian and she is literally the model for a librarian action figure. She is a champion for books, for writers and for readers all across the world. And she's also a dynamite interviewer. I have had the good fortune to be interviewed by Nancy twice now. And she is so gracious and her depth and breadth of knowledge about pretty much everything um, is absolutely astonishing. So I am really humbled to get to be the interviewer and so excited to get to turn the tables. Um, among her many honors are the 2011 Librarian of the Year Award from Library Journal and the 2011 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Pacific Northwest Booksellers Association. She's the creator of the internationally recognized program If All of Seattle Read the Same Book. She can be heard on NPR's Morning Edition and on her monthly television show, Book Lust with Nancy Pearl. She has also written several books, including Book Lust and her debut novel, George and Lizzie, and most recently, of course, The Writer's Library. So without any further ado, Nancy Pearl. Hey, Madeline, it's so nice to see you again. It's so great to see you. <laughs> we had such a good time 
Well, we had a good time doing the interview for the Writers Library, and we quote um, when we're doing these events. We we quote from your interview frequently um, because it was so interesting. It was so interesting. But I always go back to the interview that we did in in Seattle when we just talked classics, and that was so nice. So it's just a, such a treat and such an honor that you agreed to to be the interviewer for this um. evening. Of course, I would not have missed it. So um, first off, I wanna, I wanna ask you, how did the idea for this amazing piece of work come about? Well, it was actually my co-author Jeff Schwager's idea. And maybe this is a good time to bring Jeff on so he can <laughs> blush while I heap all these encomiums on him, encomia, I guess. <laughs> or whatever, as, as when I say all these nice things about him. Um, so here is my co-author, Jeff Schwager. Jeff is a fellow Seattleite. Um, he has done many things in his life, including um, he has been a writer, an editor, a producer, um, and a playwright. And he's best known, I think, as a playwright for adapting Michael Chabon's Cavalier and Clay for a theater company in Seattle. And it won a major award the year it came out. And of course, um, when we were looking for authors to to interview in the book, we um, interviewed Michael Chabon and his wife, Ayala Waldman, together which was a real treat. So um, that's Jeff and here he is. And Jeff actually Hello. had this idea. Um, Jeff and I met when he interviewed me for a project he was hired to do. He was hired to curate um, an exhibit um, from the Washington State Jewish Historical Society. They were honoring 20 Jewish women in Washington State as agents of change. And um, I was honored to be one of those 20 women and Jeff was interviewing everybody. And during the interview, um, we kept drifting off into talking about books and the books we, we both agreed that we loved and the books that maybe we didn't agree on, but we just really had this great time talking about, about, about how important books were to us. Um, and, and after that, we just started getting together, having lunch, but talking about books. And Jeff said um, at one of our lunches, well, I've had this idea for a long time. I've had this title in my mind, The Writer's Library. And, and I was thinking it would be just wonderful to do a coffee table book of physically, you know, beautiful pictures of the libraries in these writers' homes. And, you know, um, Jeff is is like a little brother to me. So I feel like I can say things like, well, I, you know, I'm not a big coffee table book person at all. <laughs> and, and, um, and I just don't think that's particularly what I would ever want to do. But I think it would be fun if we interviewed writers about the books that they loved and that turned, that made them the people they are today. And my agent, Victoria Sanders, um, said, no, Nancy, no coffee table book, you know, and then she used agent -y talk. That's not your brand. Um, but she said a, a book of interviews would be great. And so Jeff and I um, <laughs> started making separate lists of the authors that we wanted to interview. And um, maybe Jeff can take it from there. Thing that I also am not a big fan of coffee table books. It just seemed like to me that the title, I, I'm a big fan of titles, and I came up with the title and it seemed to lend itself to a coffee table book. But my experience is actually as a journalist, uh, and I've interviewed people for the last 30 years, um, writers, and uh, so it actually made much more sense for me as well to do a book of interviews. But um, yeah, we both came up with lists and um, you know, we, we sort of negotiated who we wanted to interview. And I, I was really excited to go to people's homes. It, it just seemed to me like we'd get much better interviews if we went to someone's home and could look at their books and kind of engage with them in person. And so we, we decided to do that. And we traveled um, a bit, you know, around the country to the sort of 
key literary hotspots in the country. Uh, we went all the way down the West Coast uh, to San Francisco, to uh, Los Angeles. Um, we of course went to the East Coast and uh, we, we went to your house outside of Philadelphia and uh, up to New England. Uh, the next day we actually flew up to Maine um, and then did kind of a weird circle around New England where we interviewed a bunch of people. Um, we went to uh, Minnesota, it was the strangest place in terms of literary-ness uh, that we went to um, where uh, Louise Erdrich lives. Um, but we were just, she was somebody we were both very interested in interviewing and uh, she owns a bookstore there. So we actually did the interview at her bookstore, uh, Birch Bark Books, which was really cool. And um, so, yeah, it was just, uh, once we negotiated the who we would do, um, which is not really that hard, um, we decided early on, I, I think, that we wanted an equal number of men and women. We wanted a broad representation of American culture as we see it. So it was very important to us to get uh, a lot of uh, people representing different segments of the melting pot involved. And so we got Viet Tan Nguyen, uh, is one of the interviews. Uh, Susan Choi, who just won the National Book Award for Trust Exercise, is one of the interviews. Louise Erdrich, uh, Lu Luis Alberto Urea, uh, Charles Johnson, who's a Seattleite like us and whom Nancy has known for a long time, uh, and who wrote Middle Passage, which is, is a, if people don't know it, is a wonderful novel uh, about the slave trade. Um, and it won the so really, uh, it won the award. That's right. Yeah. So it really, uh, what we were trying to do was create a uh, broad picture of America as we see it today, uh, and American authors as we see them today. And uh, you fit uh, wonderfully into that, Madeline, as uh, someone who uh, has written you know, sort of seminal feminist reinterpretations of uh, traditional uh, canonical male, uh, that, that was really exciting to us to, to get that uh, interpretation uh, and, and that viewpoint. And, and I remember one of the things was just uh, how you read books from your mother's bookshelf when you were young and, um, we talked about uh, writers. Uh, well, of course, what we remember most is the writer that you didn't like, uh, John Updike and the Witches of Eastwick, which uh, Nancy also hated, um, and which I've never read, although I, I've read some Updike. I've never read that one. But um, so, yeah, that's kind of how it came about. Wonderful, wonderful. Wow. Part of it. And I, I wanted to ask you both, since I have you here, was there anything like, what, what was the most surprising thing that came out of all these interviews? Was there something that, whether it was a theme that surprised you or a conversation, a moment, a book recommendation? So I think what surprised me the most, and actually what we're hearing from readers is surprising them the most, is how many of the writers that we interviewed talked about how important, including you, Madeline, how important Watership Down <laughs> and, and, and we're talking, we're talking very diverse writers saying, you know, Watership Down, you, Michael Chabon, were two. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I really hope that the sales for Watership Down, you know, <laughs> that we can point to that as saying, oh, the Writers Library really increased sales for Watership Down, because I, th yeah, yeah, that was what surprised. That was the sort of thing that surprised me the most. That makes me so happy, as you yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and then it, I think you know books. When when we meet people who love the same books that we love. It really is a, a, a way of coming together with them. And two of the authors that we interviewed, again, two really seemingly very different writers um, in age and in um, the type of books that they write, uh, two very different writers both talked about how important Philip K. Dick was to them in their, in their journey to become a writer. 
and one was Jonathan Lethem and the other was Charles Johnson. And, you know, it's things like that, that, that make you realize that we all read really a different version of the same book. And we all take from a book just exactly what we're ready to take from it, which is why I believe that children should be allowed to read whatever they want and not, you know, not have a parent say, well, you won't understand that or whatever a parent says, um, that, that, that you get from a book what you're ready to get from the book and nothing more and nothing less. And there's a funny story, a funny story too, um, a couple of funny stories that Jennifer Egan was reading Rebecca when she was 11 years old um, one summer and her, yeah, 11. And her mother said that she just wanted her to get done reading that book because Jennifer was so overwrought. <laughs> and I love that picture of Jennifer Egan in my mind of Jennifer Egan being overwrought. And then Louise Erdrich told us that the book that she was most interested in reading was Marjorie Morningstar by Herman Woke, which was way on the top shelf of her parents' bookshelf. And you know, so she would have to climb on a chair to try to reach it. Um, so that was, um, those sorts of things were just absolutely, um, they just made, they made the, they made our original interviews so much fun to do, but I think they also make the reading of these interviews, um, fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. With the Philip K. Dick theme was just how many writers were, uh, drawn in by sci-fi and fantasy when they were young. Um, really a diverse uh, group of writers just all loved sci-fi and fantasy. And I remember seeing quite a bit of sci-fi fantasy on your shelf, Madeline, although I think you credited your husband with much of it. Yes. Um, well, it's both. Yeah. I, yeah. I certainly love fantasy. I, I have not been such as much of a sci-fi person, but I mean, that's what Homer would be. You know, right. Homer is absolutely fantasy, um, right. and the Greek myths were, you know, so much of my way into literature. But no, I do love fantasy. When when you guys came to my house, we have these amazing built-in bookshelves that the people before us in the house built. So I can't claim credit for them, but I certainly filled them. Um, but I can't stand to be more than like ten feet away from all my favorite books. So most of my books were <laughs> upstairs in sort of the mess area, which I did not take you guys to. So a bunch of my books were downstairs. But yes, it's I, I definitely would include myself in the in the reading fantasy um, and loving fantasy and sort of the the possibilities of fantasy um, and the fun of fantasy. And you know, Dave, Dave Eggers talked about, um, I, you, you know, when you think about Dave Eggers and all that he's done um, in in his writing, but all that he's done as a humanitarian and, and his big support of children and writing. Um, I, I always would have thought that he was a uh, that he was somebody who read from a young age and just loved books and all of that. But in fact, he said he really did not become a reader until he was in high school. That he had a little bit of dyslexia, as did Richard Ford, um, which was interesting too. But that Dave Eggers. You know, people tried to get him interested in books and he read them, but it just it wasn't something that was at the top of his list of what he wanted to do. And then in high school, someone gave him a copy of Dune, Frank Herbert's great science fiction novel. And he said for two or three days when he was reading it, he was in Dune. He was there. And I think that it's that world building and that and that fast moving plot that science fiction and fantasy tend to give you, um, certainly the world building that, that makes or breaks a, a fantasy or science fiction novel. Um, it's, so that there, and the, uh, and the other science fiction um, writer who we heard about a lot was uh, Ursula Le Guin, you know, from you talking about um, the Wizard of Earth Sea and how you know, the, her changing view of women in in that. But Luis Alberto Urea talked about how um, Ursula Le Guin was really a mentor to him, somebody um, who got his first piece published 
and calls him Luisito. And he told us this fabulous story, which you have to, I can't, I don't want to give it away. It's just in the interview with Luis um, about um, advice that he would give him, uh, that she would give him about writing about women. And it's, and, um, you know, in all these interviews that we did, I, I think that there was a lot of laughter. I mean, you know, we, we went into the interviews without a, a, a set list of questions. You know, we didn't, there weren't, there wasn't the same questions that we asked every single writer. I mean, we would begin generally, I think, with me saying, did you grow up a reader or how did you, you know, were your parents readers or, or something on that on that kind of question. And then we would just let the interview be be led by the person that we were interviewing, you know, wherever they wanted to go, we went happily. And so in your case, Madeline, you know, we talked about the witches of Eastwick and, and you know, Jeff, you know, Jeff very knowledgeably said, but what about King Lear? You love King Lear. And you, and, you know, again, people have to read this because it's a too long a discussion, but you made this very good case um, of misogyny and seeming misogyny. And I, I just thought that kind of thing is, is just, I mean, it was just a It was just a great experience for us. Wasn't it, Jeff? Yeah. Yeah, it really was. And I, you know, I think we might have gone in with set questions uh, for the interviews had the first few interviews not gone as well as they did without set questions. Right. I mean, we kind of, we, we went in not really knowing how this was going to play out or even if it was going to play out. We decided to do a few interviews and see how it goes. And, um, you know, each interview kind of reinforced our confidence that we were doing this the right way by ad living it and by turning it into a, a conversation, a freewheeling conversation where we would just talk about books and, uh, you know, I could blab about Philip Roth or Dennis Johnson and we could cut that out later if we wanted to. Um, you know, we talked a lot about Laurie Moore and it seemed like everybody loves Laurie Moore. I mean, and, and I love Laurie Moore. I mean, Laurie Moore's uh, book, Like Life, is one of, you know, one of my all-time favorite books of short stories. And uh, Nancy loves uh, Laurie Moore. And I remember you loved Laurie Moore. Uh, so Laurie Moore, if you're listening, let's get a new book of short stories out. Uh, Definitely. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah, I think that the, uh, you know, the authors uh, did so much of the work for us, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And we thank you for that. <laughs> no problem. No, you you guys did all the work in, in making it happen. And as I was reading this and reading, because I was, as soon as it arrived, I, I wanted to see what all the other authors said. So of course I read it immediately. Um, and there, it's just each interview is so, I, I think you both do an amazing job of bringing out such interesting conversations, such insightful, um, comments and I mean, Lila Lalami's interview blew my mind. There, I mean, it's just every, but every interview is like that. Um, they're all, and by the end, my you know to read list now has tripled thanks right. to <laughs> thanks to this book and and all the passionate recommendations that came through it. So I think that not only is this such a gift, but I, I think it's we need this especially right now because we need books that are you know that go really deep. Um, right now. So thank you both um, for, for doing it. And I want to ask also, so I, it's interesting to hear what the common themes were. Um, and I think uh, particularly the fantasy, that's, that's very interesting to me. And I think for a long time, writers didn't like to admit that they read a lot of fantasy because it was seen as sort of, you know, maybe not as, not as highbrow. Um, but I love that, you know, people like Susanna Clark, I just interviewed Susanna Clark today about her new novel, Piranesi. I, I mean, you know, you, what a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant fantasy writer, but literary fiction writer. I mean, you know, that those categories and Ursula K. Le Guin, of course, would be the first to say this, those categories are completely irrelevant and right. mean absolutely nothing. Um, and I think I think it's it's too bad in a way 
although I read a lot of fantasy, that I didn't read more fantasy. Um, and I honestly think it was because that I wasn't reading the right fantasy, that I was reading like, no offense to him, but like Robert Heinlein, I was reading a lot of like really sexist fantasy. <laughs> and and I, I couldn't, I couldn't get past that. Um, now, if I'd been reading Octavia Butler, which is what I should have been reading, <laughs> and Ursula K. Le Guin, which I was not reading at the time, and Robin McKinley, The Hero in the Crown, you know, I think it, I think I would have, I would have even read more fantasy than I did. So I love that now there's so much more attention to these sort of the female voices from fantasy where for a long time it was such a male dominated, not in terms of who the actual writers were, but in terms of where the attention went. Well, and even some of the women who were writing had to write under a male pseudonym or just used initials um, so yeah. that nobody would know that they were women. I mean, I guess the one thing in our interview, Madeline, that really disappointed me about you, I have to say this, was that you didn't like you didn't like the book Sunshine by Robin <laughs> Henley as much as I did. I wanted you to love it. So, but I, forgive, I, I totally forgive you. I, I mean, I really, no I'm really sorry. I liked it. I like it's just every time I read Robin Kinley, I just wanted to be the hero in the crown again. Right. And if it's not, then I, you know, it has to. <laughs> I, I get it. I, I understand that. I apologize. But Nancy, for you, I will reread Sunshine. No, and no, I, no, no. It's more it's important that you work on your new book. Save <laughs> Sunshine uh, for later, for, for when you're traveling. For Have the you been? I will. I promise. <laughs> Good. Great. Have you, have you found the pandemic a time when you can write, Madeline? No, but that has to do with being the parent of young children, as you both know, because my children were uh -huh. raging this entire interview. Um, so <laughs> it has not been a great time for writing, but I continue to uh, think about what Ann Patchett says, where she says, sometimes I'm writing and sometimes I'm living. So now I'm living right now. And I'm still thinking about it. I'm still, you know, I do a lot of thinking about the novel, but I feel like it's been so important during this time, you know, particularly for young children. We're, we're all confused. We're all stressed. Nobody knows what's going on. And it was really important for me to just be fully present for them. And, and so I felt like, you know, it's okay for me to straddle those two things when things are calm, but I really just needed to be with them. So um, I, I am coming back to it because I think things are settling down and we're getting a routine and we just moved houses. So that is out of the way. Um, but, you know, I, I this is my living time. Mm. And what about reading? What have you been what have you been drawn to read during this time? Well, I am just I, I mentioned Susanna Clark, her new novel, Piranesi. Yeah. I don't know if you read it. No, not yet. Nancy, did you read I, it? I, I, I couldn't. It, I had a hard time getting into it. I oh, have to so say, I think that's pandemic writing. I mean, that's my pandemic reading issue is getting yeah. into books fast enough to keep me into it. But mm -hmm. if you loved it that much, then I, I, I will go back to it. I have it. I, I really did. I felt like it was a haven. I felt like it was like, mm -hmm. this is peace. There's peace in this book. But also there's this incredibly gripping mystery that kind of kicks up. Um, but there are, I, I remember at first I was like, oh, there are a lot of descriptions of statues in these first two pages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but you you just keep going, keep going. It's it's so brilliant. And it's it's really, um, I, I, I absolutely loved that. Well, um, I, oh, oh. I, oh, I was going to say that I love Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, so I was really looking forward mm -hmm. to the new book. Yes, and it has it has the same that it's a completely different. It reminds me of something my agent said to me, which she said, you know, readers think they want the same book, but really they want to feel the same way. Yeah, with a completely mm -hmm. different book, and I think Piranesi will do that by the time you get to the end. I think. Okay. okay. All right. I'll treat sunshine for Piranesi. <laughs> And that's, and that's exactly what I say to library school students um, about helping readers find their next good book, that readers want the same book, but really, you know, they say they want the same book, but really what they want is to feel the same. And it's, a, you know, that that's what's important. Yeah. Yes. A wise agent. 
Yeah, <laughs> she is. This is Julie Bearer. She's she's brilliant. Um, she's also Luis Urea's agent. So, um, so what el what else are you reading? What would you recommend for for this moment, both of you? Well, Jeff, you you go first because you're reading both of our maybe favorite mm. favorite writer. Yes. Well, uh, so most recently, I've been reading rereading uh, John O'Hara. Uh, who's completely fallen out of vogue, um, if he was ever in vogue. Uh, but I, I reread Appointment in Samara. I reread uh, Sermons in Soda Water, which is the book that Nancy and I both love the most. It's a collection of three novellas that are written in this beautiful retrospective voice, written in the late 50s, but reflecting on the 30s. Um, and then I just read, uh, for the first time, uh, an O'Hara book called The Instrument, which was about a playwright in the 60s, which I can guarantee uh, you would both hate. <laughs> um, uh, and I, it wasn't well received at the time, but it's very uh, dated in its uh, sexual politics. I think, you know, O'Hara is someone who was praised uh, at times uh, in his career for being one of the first male writers to talk frankly about female sexuality and to talk about how uh, women uh, were allowed to have uh, erotic feelings uh, and, and weren't just supposed to grin and bear it or think of England or uh, whatever the phrases were. Um, but by the time he got to writing The Instrument, which I, I think is next to last book, uh, I think he had gone way too far in uh, imagining uh, what he thought women were thinking. And it's, it's a little bit more, actually. He needed to have Ursula Le Guin give him a few. That's right. <laughs> yes, oh, right. very much so. Right. Yeah. And I also actually read, um, I've read three current books. Uh, I read the new David Mitchell book, Utopia Avenue, which is a terrifically entertaining book about a rock, English rock band in the 60s, kind of a cross between Pink Floyd and Fairport Convention, if anyone out there is a, a fan of 60s rock. And I really, I loved it. I love books about rock and roll. Um, and he did it really well. And then I read two books that were written before the pandemic and that haven't come out yet, but which are about to come out. One was Jonathan Lethem's new book, The Arrest, and the other was Don DeLillo's new book, The Silence. And both of them deal with worlds in which, uh, basically the current world, but all mechanical life has failed and people are stuck in worlds in which there is no electricity and uh, no, um, just nothing mechanical is working. And it's a very isolated, uh, they're isolated worlds and they feel very, relevant to the current moment, even though they were written before it and uh, aren't dealing with pandemics, uh, just the sense of isolation that I feel and that I've, you know, heard from many other people that they're feeling as well. And, and, and these books deal very deeply with that. And I think uh, Lethem's book is due out next month and Delillo's book is due out the following month. So I'd recommend both of those uh, as books people should look for and Utopia mm -hmm. Avenue in the meantime. Madeline, I think you mentioned being a David Mitchell fan. Have you read Utopia yeah. Avenue? I am, I got to interview <laughs> Oh, you did? I did, it was really um, exciting. My, my publicist, my old publicist moved and then she became his publicist and she remembered that I had raved about David Mitchell. And so she said, you know, I was living the dream. She said, do you want to interview David Mitchell? <laughs> Um, so he is, he's an absolutely the most gracious person to interview. Um, he's just so much fun and, and he has great questions. One, one of the questions that he asked, which, um, cause he, he threw all kinds of questions back at me. That's he, <laughs> he, he would not be tamed. Um, is, is he, is he said that he likes to ask the question about sort of, 
you know, everything that you consume as a child goes sort of into the writer's pile. It's formative, even if it's, you know, something that's kind of maybe junky or something that is, you know, surprising. And so uh, saying that oftentimes writers don't like to talk about the things that were formative, that they consumed obsessively, but that, you know, were something that they, they might not want to advertise that they consumed it or they sort of haven't thought about, you know, how it might have affected them. So I thought that was a really interesting question. Now I just want to ask everyone that. So now I ask both of you, David Mitchell's question. <laughs> what, what were the things that were, that you felt like, was there something that you feel like was really formative in shaping you as a reader, as a book lover, as an intellect that, um, you know, you might not think to give credit to, but was like really right there at the foundation? So, uh, so th with me, the the author who really had the most influence on me, I think on my on my writing, but also on my reading, is a writer who wrote for teenagers um, named Mary Stoltz, and she was writing in the fifties and the sixties, and she won the Newbery Award for a children's book, um, but I, but her children's books even though I was a children's librarian, they weren't my favorite. But her teenage novels were all written in a kind of stream of consciousness style. And, I, you know, there's nobody else writing, there was nobody else writing for teens that wrote in that sort of interior way and really, I think, really got at what it was like to be a teenager. And the two books by her that I would absolutely recommend they're not in print, so you have to find them either at library book sales is where I found most of them. Um, the one is called In a Mirror, and the other is called Second Nature. And I think she she also wrote another children's book that is called Cat in a Mirror. So ignore that and, you know, lop off the cat and In a Mirror and Second Nature. And I find that what she, what she taught me about reading was that what I'm always looking for in books are, is wonderful writing and a kind of three-dimensional character development or three-dimensional characters that allow me to understand where they came from, where they are, and think about where they're going. I, I, she's a wonderful, wonderful writer. I would love to see all of her teenage novels um, back in print, but it's hard for me to imagine teens reading them these days. Yeah. Mm. Now I'm going to go read this. Yeah, yeah, you should. Try to find In a Mirror. <laughs> in a Mirror. I almost got that reprinted, but <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, what about you? Well, I think my answer is much more boring. Uh, the, the writer who most influenced me was F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, just the beauty of his language uh, really opened up for me the, the beauty of writing. Uh, just the sentences, the paragraphs, uh, the, the enchanted way that uh, his vocabulary uh, fed uh, his characters. And um, yeah, there was a story called Winter Dreams. I remember in high school, I, I was not much of a reader as a young person. I was more into baseball and rock and roll. And uh, I was home on a rainy afternoon when I was in high school. And um, my mother had, my mother died when I was uh, 10 and her, her books were left behind. And uh, one day I, I picked one of her books up off the shelf and it was, I think it was called Winter Dreams and Other Stories. And I read this story, Winter Dreams, which is kind of a, 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 a almost a first draft of The Great Gatsby. Uh, it's about this young man's infatuation with this sort of idyllic dream girl. And, and it's very, you know, sort of immature in that way. Uh, but the, the language was so beautiful. And, 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 I, and I just got lost in, in the same way that one gets lost in a beautiful piece of music. I could just hear it and feel the language. And uh, I read everything by Fitzgerald after that. And... Um, that really, that's what turned me on most to writing. And, and I think as I, you know, tried my own experiments in writing, as I got older, I always had in mind the beauty of that language. 
Should we take Danny, I see you. <laughs> yes, I'm back on here because we do have some questions from the audience. And Jeff, I've had to keep uh, toggling your mic on and off. That's why sometimes I'm going to do it again. Um, we're getting a little bit of feedback from, from Jeff's microphone. So, um, Jeff, if you're muted and if you start talking um, and we don't hear you, um, I'll, I'll unmute you really quickly. I've been doing that all along because um, so, I'm not quite sure what the connection is. So uh, we do have some questions here from the audience, but I just have to say, uh, Nancy, as you were talking about uh, Mary Stoltz, it reminded me um, when I was younger, um, and I was also, uh, before I became a librarian, a teacher, and worked with kids, and I grew up in Canada. Um, it comes out in my accent sometimes. And um, uh, Jean Little, I'm not sure if oh, you're aware. Jean Little is wonderful. I know, she was somebody, as in my childhood, I read everything by her, um, the book Spring Begins in March and From Anna. I can still, I was like probably seven or eight, and I can still remember exactly where I was reading those books. In I had a little cubby hole where I read, and it was like wintertime. I can remember like just hold up reading those books and being, yeah, and I read everything by Jean Little. I mean, every single one of her books, um, as well as The Wizard of Oz. I read not just The Wizard of Oz. I read the entire series start to finish, um, TikTok Girl and, you know, The Patchwork Girl of Oz and TikTok of Oz the entire series. And the funny thing is, is I, as an adult, I am not a fantasy reader and I never have even read Harry Potter, for instance. Um, I don't read a lot of fantasy, but for some reason when I was younger, The Wizard of Oz was what I needed, but it's no longer what I need. So I think our reading habits can change. So, very much. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's, let's look at a question here. And if anybody else is in the audience, um, and also that's funny, you were saying about John O'Hara. Um, he's one of the people that's on our um, literary, map of Princeton and he's buried in the Princeton Cemetery and he has this really funny um, epitaph on his tombstone which I put into the chat here um, and he wrote it himself and you know d demanded it beyond his tombstone because uh, he always felt he was being um, overlooked um, by, the, by the university. <laughs> Better than anyone else he told the truth about his time the first half of the 20th century. He was a professional he wrote honestly and well. So that is on John O'Hara's tombstone in the Princeton Cemetery, and he wrote it and insisted that that's how it would be on there because he would, if he hadn't been fully recognized um, in the town of Princeton while he was alive, he would be recognized in death. Um, anyhow, so that's just our little up, uh, and then of course, yeah, so that's a little Princeton connection to John O'Hara, so. Well, Janie, I yeah. want to tell you that my favorite, I, I wish I could take you all downstairs and show you my my two favorite um, Jean Little books, which are on my oh downstairs um one was called mine for keeps yes remember that oh yeah. it's so wonderful <laughs> it's just so good yeah. yeah and what was the other one? Oh, i have to i have to look i'm looking to see what the um name of it was yeah, mine for keeps um mine for keeps and um ba, 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 wait a minute wait 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 um oh oh well, mine for keeps and look through my window was wonderful. Yes. Oh, and home from far. Yes, I read them all, and her life story is so fascinating. She actually uh, find her um, autobiography to read, um, you know, because she was disabled with, you know, you know, she was blind, and a lot of her characters come out in that. And it was really right. quite ahead of its time for the, being in the nineteen sixties and seventies. What she wrote, and she never let that get her down. She was just an amazing person all around. Yeah. Um, anyhow, um, okay, so uh, let's see, just do a question here. Um, so Amy wants to know um, if the secret history influenced you at all in your love of the classics. And I don't know if that is directed to Madeline or to all of you, um, or if any of you have, I can have an answer for that. Just raise your hand. If, you, if it's you, Jeff, I'll take you off mute. No? Well, my, my interest in the classics preceded the secret history, but I certainly think for people of that age, Donna Tartt's novel probably um, probably did have influence on, on them. Same with you, Madeline, or? I, so I came to the secret history um, sort of after I, I had already 
you know, thrown my lot in with classics because I, I had I learned um, I had a I had a wonderful Latin teacher in high school who taught me Greek. So I was I was already sort of well into it. And then I, I found the secret history. Um, I think I read it in college and I, I of course I loved it. It was amazing. Um, and it was so exciting and it was so exciting to see, you know, a novel about classics, something that I loved. So I think it, it sort of continued to encourage me rather than rather than than sparking it. Um, but Donna Tartt is, is such an incredible writer and I and I owe a lot to her. Um, she was very, very kind to me when Song of Achilles came out. So it, which, you know, could not have been more of an honor for me. Um, apparently, ever since then she gets sent absolutely everything that relates to anything classical, <laughs> um, including Song of Achilles. And she does not do any blurbs, which is very wise of her, because um, I'm sure she would be blurbing all, all the time and not have time to write. But um, she called up Ann Patchett and she said, I'd like you to read this book, The Song of Achilles and blurb it since I'm not blurbing. And Ann Patchett did. And because of that, you know, Song of Achilles had this incredible sort of author behind it. So I am so grateful to Donna Tartt and not only to her writing, but to her as a generous writer helping a young writer. And, and <laughs> Donna Tartt is a wonderful reader. You know, the one author that we interviewed for the book who we didn't do in person because we could never be in the same place <laughs> as Donna was, was we did an email interview um, with her about, um, which really, I think, captures the kind of reader that she is. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's do another question here. Um, so um, the question is um, about, well, there's two questions here about Watership Down, um, both having to do with um, why do you think it was so important to the writers you interviewed as well as the readers of the Writer's Journal and, and um, for Madeline, did, did it have any influence on your specific development as a writer? Well, Madeline, why don't you take that whole question? Because <laughs> probably for, for everyone. All right, I'm gonna try not to run out the rest of our time on Watership Down. So um, it is a really, ex so I think there are a couple of things about it that, that really spoke to me. Um, it is character driven and it is also, epic, even though it's about bunnies. Richard Adams was clearly deeply steeped in sort of the Greek tragedies um, and in Greek epic. And basically, it's like a rewrite of the Aeneid. It's the Aeneid with rabbits. Um, and, you know, here is our, the, the Warren gets destroyed at the beginning. This is the small band of refugees who's trying to find a new home. And then once they find a new home, they have to defend it against, you know, terrible, terrible warfare. Um, and it all sounds ridiculous when you say it's about bunnies, but it's, it's, he really takes it seriously and, and, and he's examining sort of what makes a good leader. Um, there are all these wonderful moments of kind of wisdom about how to be a good leader and and how to um, take people through difficult times. It also has this absolutely thrilling final stretch. Like the last hundred pages are just edge of your seat. Go, 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 go. Are they going to make it? Is it all going to come together? Um, and it's really, it's really it's just it's it has fantasy it has epic but it also feels really grounded in the real like there are all these sort of small things about rabbits like for example um according to the author rabbits cannot count to to sort of more than four anything over four is just five it's it's literally it's like rare it means many and um what a great grounding detail for the way rabbits see the world. And so there's like this really specific world building at the same time that's really exciting, but it's not, it's, it's very different from, and this is not to knock Redwall, but it's very different from the Redwall type of building where, you know, there's like little mice dressed up like friars and they serve like delicious comfit feasts. And, you know, it's, it's very anthropomorphized. These rabbits are still rabbits. Um, they have a rabbit language. They see things through rabbit eyes. So I don't know, some combination of the world building, the characters, the wisdom, and the excitement. So um, the main thing that I think really resonated with me is, is that exciting ending. I thought, wow, you, you have to write a good ending. 
Um, and I really, you know, I kind of swore then that if I if I ever wrote a book that I would want to write, try to write a real good ending. <laughs> That's and awesome. you did. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. So you all have the copy of your, I know that Madeline has a copy of the book there. Do you all have a copy of the book at hand? The Writer's Library? Yes. What I want to do is, uh-oh, I have somebody coming in the door. Hang on. <laughs> okay. Hi. I want you each to find a, uh, your favorite illustration in the book or just show us some of the illustrations if you could please so um this is an illustration of michael shaban and his wife ayella waldman the reason it says somewhere on here that there are 20 23 writers and 22 interviews is because we interviewed michael and ayella together um in their dining room at lunchtime and if you're interested in children's books at all, this is probably the interview that has the most references to children's books, um, because we Michael Michael is someone who st who who really believes in the importance of reading aloud to his children, and he read aloud to all four of his kids until they were um, teenagers, early teens, and. Um, and I think the last book that he read aloud to them, it was Watership Down. So oh. there's, I know, I know. Michael, so here's Michael and I yell it. I love, I love this one. I mean, they're, they're all amazing, but I love that one. Yeah, yeah that's a wonderful one of Layla. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, so here, <laughs> my, can you see this? This is, um, this is Madeline Miller, and uh, this is a wonderful drawing. Uh, love the detail in this, and it's really beautiful. But I also, uh, I'm going to show a second one as well if I can, and it's just uh, Donna Tart. Oh. Uh, and what I love about this one is that her, she's looking off to the side, um, and uh, I don't, I don't, I, I'll just reveal a little story that Donna was the only uh, writer who asked for approval of her drawing. Um, and and she sent us a photo to, to base the drawing on and, and loved it. So gave us approval right away. But um, it was interesting that that she that she's very conscious, I think, of her image, and uh, she's very a very careful person as well as a very careful writer. And uh, but just said something about her to me uh, about how careful she is. Yeah, uh, we did have a question on also about organizing bookshelves. Are we looking at your bookshelves and do you have methodologies for organizing your bookshelves or something to recommend? Um, well, my bookshelves, what's behind me here are all the books that I'm supposed to read and review. So I'm not <laughs> sure that's going to happen anytime soon. Um, but um, but my but my keeper bookshelves are are arranged loosely by author alphabetical by author but very loose um, so I'm still I still frequently have trouble finding um, a book even though I know who the author is because um, yeah and but you also have some puzzles there I see so I do, these are my this is like I do these are my pandemic puzzles. Um, <laughs> I can now stock a whole puzzle store with all the thousand piece puzzles that I've done, worked on um, and yeah. done during the pandemic. And your books look very well organized, Jeff. What's up with those? Uh, the, we're, we're actually in the film section of my personal library. Uh, these are, uh, I was a film critic for uh, many years, among other things, and um, have a huge collection of film books. So uh that's what these are um, and also my mcsweeney's books and i don't know if you can see this head here but this is the famous mcsweeney's uh head uh book uh it's um a cube Ooh, yeah. shaped uh like a human head and uh inside are chat books of uh various uh pieces by different writers including um michael shaban's second uh, novel, what was supposed to be a second novel, Fountain City, uh, and he spent years working on it and finally abandoned it, and uh, it had never been published in any uh, way, and he allowed McSweeney's to publish an excerpt from it that's part of this uh, little collector's item. So that's, uh, so my books are, you know, poetry, 
plays, fiction, of course, uh, is the vast majority. And then I, I do have this film section uh, that's quite substantial. Great. Okay, so this is going to be our last question before we go out. Um, so we have somebody on here, and I don't think I'm going to say this name correctly, uh, Leslie, Leslie, who said that after reading uh, Thursday, they started reading all the ancient epics right away and was never a big reader before that. But then they've also gone into the ask a question comment to ask, uh, do you have any advice to give a high school student aspiring to create stories? So what would you advice would you give to younger people who are looking towards a writing career? Um, I, I think I would say, first of all, thank you. That is so lovely. And I, I think what I would say is that it takes a lot of drafts for something good and that that is okay. I think that particularly in our culture right now, there's this sort of like extra drive towards the hot take, getting to something quickly, feeling like you have to write the perfect, you know, witticism, witty thing the first time. But books are really, really slow burns. And, you know, all your favorite writers, whoever they may be, take draft after draft after draft, and they write a lot of stuff that isn't good. Like Michael Shaban, you know, he felt like he, like he couldn't get that book to come together. And that happens all the time to the most incredibly accomplished writers you can imagine. And so if you're struggling with something, that's just part of the process, it's part of the road, it's completely normal. And I think that it can feel in that moment like this is a terrible failure, this is an, an indictment of me as a person, but it's really not, it's just part of you learning what the story is. Can I, can I just give you Ernest Gaines' answer to that question, Ernest Gaines? taught creative writing, you know, taught creative writing. Um, and someone, when he was in Seattle, someone asked him what advice they would, that Ernest, what, what, what advice would Ernest give to someone who wanted to be a writer? And Ernest said, well, that's very easy. I have an eight, eight words of advice. Read, 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 write, 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 write. And I, <laughs> I really think that the best writers are readers and, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. to go back to the writer's library, I think that's what we saw um, as we interviewed these 23 wonderful writers was their lives as readers. I agree. I and, agree. And Jeff, yeah. do you have any words of wisdom? I was going to say read uh, would be my advice to anybody who wants to be a writer. Just read. Just read everything you can, uh, read the best work you can. Always challenge yourself to read something better. Sometimes if you don't get something, uh, it's okay not to finish it, but it's also okay to try harder to understand what the writer's trying to say and how they're trying to say it and to stick with something, uh, especially when you're young, life is very long and uh, you have plenty of time, so read. Right. Thank you so much. I, I want to just say thank you to all of you for being on here with us tonight. And um, it's been a wonderful hour long discussion of, of, of books and reading and, you know, writing. And that's just kind of, um, you know, as a librarian, uh, a thrill for me to be here with you, Nancy and, and Madeline and Jeff. And I, I can tell you, um, often we close our chat down during these sessions, but we kept it open because the chat that was going on was just too wonderful. Everybody's sharing their experiences about books and reading. And um, I think that actually kind of really added to this, uh, to, to the fun. And we did do some polls here. And I will tell you that 66% um, of our people on here have been reading more in the last six months because of the pandemic, because they're not leaving their home. Um, and 26% are reading less because they're too distracted to focus on books. And only 6% um, have said they haven't noticed a change. And um, also, literary fiction is strongly by 50, about 50%, that's their favorite genre. Mystery and suspense are up there as our historical fiction, science fiction. I'm surprised nobody voted for, for memoir. I'm a big reader of memoir. Um, so um, we were actually speaking of memoir, we're gonna be having um, next Friday night, so a week from tomorrow night, Maria Hinojosa on here for her new memoir about uh, growing up as an immigrant here in the United States, Once I Was You. Um, which has gotten a lot of buzz. And I think that's gonna be a really great event. So if you're around next Friday evening and looking for something to do, uh, come back and, and meet Maria. Um, and so we've had some interesting polls, some great conversation, and we've shared a lot of books. And 
Um, I think this is going to be a great book for the gift giving season, which is just around the corner. Um, so I know personally, um, that would be something I would love to get get as a gift. I didn't if I didn't already own it. Um, <laughs> I could it in the library, but I, I don't have it here. Um, so if you're going to buy one for yourself, buy one to give. And the link to order from Labyrinth is right down there. They're standing by, and um, we we always work with uh, independently owned bookstores. We are a big believer in supporting our indie bookstores here. I think libraries and indie bookstores have a lot to share and a lot in common. And um, we, we like to have that symbiosis in our town, so. Janie, could I say one thing? Jeff and I have, since we can't be in person to sign the books, we do have signed book plates. And in the chat box, I put my email. And if people right. want to write to, to, to me, we will get um, book plates in the mail to you. Um, and if you want your, your book personalized, then let us know that. Let me know that in the email. Nancy, that is just so generous. I mean, that you would even take the time to do that. That is like, incredible. Um, now I know what I'm getting my mom for Christmas. Gonna <laughs> order another one and you'll be, you'll be getting an email from me um, okay. because I am, I, am a, I am a reader and a librarian because of my mom who, you know, I think, I think readers are made in the homes. Um, and my mom and I share a passion for reading. So I think, you know, to everybody out there who was encouraging young children to read, keep doing it. And uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you, Jeff, Nancy, Madeline. It's just been, I don't want this to end, but we must. Our yeah. hour is up. So let's all wave goodbye. And um, we'll hope to see everybody again. And I guess that's it. It's always awkward ending these things. So we're just going to wave goodbye and see you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Janie. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.